Hi, everyone, and welcome to FCM Think. My name is Charlene Lees, and I'm the president of Flight Center Travel Group in the Americas. Today, I have the real pleasure of speaking with Suzanne Neufang from GBTA. She is the CEO and here with me in person. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Charlene. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's a real pleasure to have you here today. I understand that you have some um, some data and some new updated statistics that you'd like to share with everyone. Yeah, data throughout this whole pandemic process has been so important because it shows us not only where we've been, but how to get out and how, well, how the light at the end of the tunnel is actually showing up. And we've been doing monthly surveys since the beginning of the pandemic. We did number 26 wow. just a few weeks ago. And some of that data I'd like to share with you today. So first of all, it's that travel is coming back. And I know that makes you happy, that makes us mm. happy as well. Um, but what is important that we also note is that in past crises, we as an industry uh, have reacted and responded and we've come together, but the way back has not been a, a sharp straight line or not certainly not a hockey, uh, hockey stick line up. So what we've seen is that this, this crisis has been a lot like the 9-11 crisis that we would have mm -hmm. seen as the slide shows or as we saw certainly in the Great Recession. And it took three to four to five years for normal to come back, for mm. numbers to come back, uh, because CFOs learn their lessons through those kinds of crises, as do risk managers. Uh, and there is a fair bit of continuity that we see from those other crises in this one as well. So this year, I think as we go to the next slide, we'll see that what we also see is that domestic travel has come back much more quickly than international. I'm sure you've seen this as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, yes. And we, we see numbers such as in our latest poll, 73% have resumed non-essential domestic business travel. Mm -hmm. That's the top of the heap as far as we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've also seen though is that international travel is lagging mm -hmm. naturally. There are still rules for how to come back in. You and I have been just talking about That's right. how that international cross-border into especially the United States and some other countries, you need to test negative in a very short period of time and that keeps travelers and their companies from always wanting to take them there. I think what we see on the other, the next slide as well is that the intent to travel the next three months are really important. And we see over 90% with an intent of increasing their domestic non-essential business trips. So mm -hmm. that is a really positive sign. Doesn't mean they're going back to 2019 levels, but okay. an increase in intent and uh, over over 80 percent on the international side. So there's some optimism on the international side yeah. as well. Um, and then finally, the last slide that I'll, I'll kick this off with is that suppliers in from January to February saw a doubling of business travel bookings. And this is from a hotel, airline, car uh, support side. Um, so they are also seeing the advanced booking increase mm, mm -hmm. during that period of time as well, which I'm sure is music to your ears as you work with clients on these issues every day. Absolutely, yes. And I would say from January to February, there was a major increase, but we're seeing that month on month. And Amazing. I don't know if it's pent up demand um, and it's gonna eventually settle out. I'd, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on that. But so far, even yeah. April, on March, we're seeing just incredible increases in the FCM business for corporate travel. Yeah, we see that that's consistent. I think okay. there we predicted last November when we came out with our business travel index uh, research for you know the next three to four years that this year would see a surge, mm. um, with an assumption that variants wouldn't raise you know too much of an ugly head. Uh, and also that barriers would continue to go away because government barriers are still perceived by our members globally as the number one restriction yes. to business travel coming back. Uh, but we were predicting last November or something like a 38, some 33 to 38% increase this year, year over year. And on a, on a maybe 21% increase year over year, 21 to 20. Mm. So I think that, that that bodes well for this year and certainly yeah. airlines feel really full this year. I don't know how your experience Absolutely. has been. Absolutely, no, pretty much every flight I think that we're, we're taking is, is incredibly full, which is great. It would be wonderful if we could remove the restrictions to re-entry in the USA, yes. as we talked about earlier. I think that certainly is the fear of being dislocated <laughs> while you're traveling is really probably the it's number real. one barrier, as you mentioned. 
mentioned. So um, certainly want to be able to support that as much as we can. But what do you think when you talk about the new normal and how the industry has rebounded from various crises in the past, and we've all been through them, this one is different, of course. Mm -hmm. What do you think that some of the trends that are really going to uh, take over uh, would be? There's, there's a few trends that we certainly see. One, first of all, is sustainability yeah. is what everybody is talking about. We hear it from suppliers where buyers are talking to them. We hear buyer members telling us this in every region. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still uh, maybe a little bit more dominant in yeah. Europe um, and other parts of the world than in North America, but it's still something that is prevalent here. And some stats that, that, we are, that we've shared here with you today is what is driving some of this is certainly um, what people are feeling within the disaster zones in their mm -hmm. family areas and within their own geographies. And here's a NOAA statistic yeah. that we see as well. We see that 200, uh, there might be 200 million re climate refugees within a few years or decades that we need to be very cognizant of. We've also made note, uh, as have our buyer members, that up to 100 airports, if sea levels rise by a meter, 100 global airports will be underwater. So this starts to affect our own industry. Yeah. And then finally, we certainly know that um, the, the demand for air travel has never been stronger and it continues to grow year over year that compared with just a few years ago when uh, four and a half billion travelers traveled in 2019, up to 10 billion will be traveling by 2050. Yeah. So with our eyes uh, and our sights on 2050, thanks to COP26 and right. some of the things that came out of uh, that very important conference last year, which by the way, was one of the biggest events that happened in the COVID era. So we were watching it from many, many standpoints. Mm -hmm. The sustainability tracks that we've been asked to bring forward as an association of like-minded people who are here to solve problems that aren't easy to solve. Um, sustainability has been one of the most common things that we've been asked to do. And we started up a sustainability practice this year for the first time. So that's that's been, um, it, it's, it's a lot of work to do very quickly because we need to get uh, a lot of insights and opinions mm. and then work with policymakers to see what that that uh, that opportunity is. But for us, from an industry perspective, it's important for us to do for ourselves so that policymakers don't think we're doing nothing yep. and do it to us. So we need to be part of that solution. And that's really the, the primary mission of our sustainability practice at the moment. I couldn't agree more. And it's important to start somewhere, right? You can't do everything at once. But the fact yes. that GBTA has really uh, kicked off a number of those initiatives. I know we recently appointed a chief sustainability officer. Amazing. So many of our customers and and our colleagues in the industry have done the same. And it's really just important that we all come together where this is concerned, because some of those statistics that you pointed out really put things in perspective. You know, not just how it impacts our lives and how it impacts all of our people and future generations, but the industry as well. Um, and as you mentioned, we're really talking beyond recovery, beyond just the COVID totally. crisis recovery. We know the future of travel in business and, and certainly for, for leisure travel is going to be incredibly strong because people are always going to want to see the world. And so we have to take care of that, that planet. And, and I think it's it's important that we don't have uh, in-person meaning shame. Yeah. I think it's important to take care of the planet while we take care of business. And that is really what, what your business is. Mm -hmm. That's really what our business is. Uh, that when we, we saw this, I, I've seen it since probably August when I started attending some larger meetings and mm -hmm. some smaller meetings that, that when you're together, you can get so much more done in a shorter amount of time. You can also get tougher issues addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point in time, it's important to also consider that business travel gets business done, but it also uh, helps helps cultures come together. It certainly is a benefactor for world peace, something that we're all thinking about more lately. Yes. It is also something that brings the world closer together. And we need to do that responsibly, but we, we can't just say stop business travel because there would be a whole continuum of what we build within corporate cultures, what we do on those trips for internal and external travel that are really important for us as humans. I think we've learned through the pandemic that when you can't see other humans, life is different and it's not the life that we really, really think that we need on this planet. Couldn't agree more. And I think also when we're talking about the importance of the traveler and health and mental health, you know, travel really plays into that as well. 
being able to have those really important face-to-face -face interactions yes. and get things done, as you just mentioned, so much easier in person. Um, so I think that's really critically important. I know that the meetings and events uh, area, certainly within our company and, and across the industry, has changed phenomenally throughout yes. this pandemic. You know, they've learned to pivot to hybrid meetings and, and virtual meetings in some respects. But I think now more than ever, we're busier bringing people together because so many it's companies just really want to get their people together. And um, they know how important that is for culture and for the I progress agree. of the business. I agree. Some employees have started work and left work, complete companies, but then when never having met their colleagues. That's right. And I think that there's, uh, you know, some some engagement uh, methodologies for measuring employee engagement mm. have to do with how connected you are to your your colleagues. And yeah. I think that that is something that's missing when you don't see them. And that's really, really, I think some very human, you know, social science outputs and psychology that comes out of this pandemic learning as well. I think the other thing you said, which is it, it takes us into, I think, the second trend that we see, which is people first. Yep. And people first from the sense, uh, you know, not that everybody's going to put them in business class because we need to make them feel like every th life is luxurious. Mm. But I think wellness, um, risk management from a health perspective, it became so important. The, the buyers you deal with, I am sure, are like our general audience at GBTA on the buyer side. They have a more strategic seat at the table because they are part of the human supply chain of human human travel mm -hmm. and that meant that they were they were meeting with hr with sustainability officers of course with risk managers and that seat at the hr table more fully certainly with people first has come i think into policies how policies are being promoted um, how trips are managed mm -hmm. uh, maybe fewer trips but longer trips right. so that there is less wear and tear on the people as they're doing what they're doing. And then I think where people work, ultimately this comes down to what are your new work policies? Where do you work? How often do you have to come into an office? People might be traveling a lot for work, but they're not actually commuting as much or at all. That's How right. do you see that with your clients? Yes, I know. I think we're seeing, generally speaking, across our customer base that everybody wants to return to some level of office environment, you know, whether it's a, a hybrid three days in the office, mm -hmm. two days remote, or um, they're giving their travelers actually some sort of allowance to be able to come back if they've moved and they're not able to be in the office on a regular basis, they need to come in monthly or quarterly. So mm -hmm. I think there's an absolute trend about the importance of being together. We talked about that with travel, but also yes. when, when we're talking about our office space culture. Um, but it's different. It's not gonna be the way it was because the world has changed, right? And our people's needs have changed. And certainly that, that recognition of mental health balance you know, work-life balance and yes. being able to give back to the people that have been through um, such a challenging time. I think it's important, right. just like everything. It, it's going to be a different environment going forward, but that personal connection has never been more important. Yeah, I see that yeah. as well. Um, I, I think the, 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 the future of work as we think about it, because that's something that probably GBTA has never really thought about the mm. future of work. You know, it was all about the future of travel, but not the That's future right. of work. Yeah. And I think what we learned is that uh, there were delays in business travel coming back because people weren't in offices. There was no place to meet. Yes. And when you don't have a place to meet, you can meet in a cafe, but you can't show PowerPoint slides that mm -hmm. easily. You know, flipping over your flipping your laptop open you can show one person slides, but certainly not a room full of people. Um, and the engagement sort of trickled in through those sort of, oh, it's my first coffee. We probably all remember those. <laughs> so you're my first person I'm meeting with in COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then it transitioned into meeting places and the ability to do that. So as offices finally are opening up again and some of those two to three day a week yeah. um, policies are coming back again. The people first side of it also means how can people get their work done best and feel like they're accomplishing what they need to do. And I think that becomes to me a big B word balance. I think That's there will right. be balance that we all think about as we continue through this recovery phase. I agree. How many people are you meeting for the first time not on Zoom, You right? It's we celebrate every week. That's so right. it's uh, it's one of those things. Certainly in my job, I started my job about 14 months ago mm. and the first six 
were in my second bedroom of my apartment. Yeah. <laughs> and it uh, I was certainly glad to get out of my apartment to actually meet people. That's right. Um, and I think that this engagement that that uh, all of our customers and our members and our supplier and buy side uh, are reflecting on is that um, after you break the ice, mm -hmm. people, again, that people aspect, um, the pandemic was very personal. They all have different ice breaking moments that they feel like they've just done something they didn't think they, they couldn't wait to do or they thought it would take longer to do and they're just relieved that that is happening. So. You know, I would say too that that's a real um, a real strong point for GBTA and the conference that you had in November. It oh, was so great. important to break the ice and get people back together, uh, even though it wasn't maybe the same size as we've had exactly. in the past and the, the season changed and so forth. But just having that first conference and getting everybody back together, I think was critically important you. and you could see it right? Just on the people's faces. They were just happy to be back. And now I know we're going to do it for real this summer as well. Uh, we're so excited. I think what we have lined up is both uh, a different way of conversing. Mm. So more TED Talk, less maybe 1980s style of what we were really known for. It's it's a chance, I guess, the pandemic gives us permission to do things differently. And yeah. that part is certainly a lot of fun so that we we can educate, bring learning and, mm. and networking opportunities for people in a way that we we are experimenting with and so the, we've uh, the experiment is, continues so i think that that's something that's important yeah well it's important to evolve and i think that that certainly has taught exactly. all of us that we've got to continue to change and to bring new opportunities to our customers and to each other and just always be moving right and changing and that exactly. and so that's really important how and, if i could ask you a question yeah. how how has your people how have your people responded your your staff where do you, as uh, FCM Americas, where where have you seen the ice breaking, and uh, were you right back into it as soon as the pandemic hit, or how have you seen these two years from your your position of leadership? I mean, our teams are incredible, first of all. So they, from the beginning, they've been uh, nonstop, obviously during the pandemic, trying to bring people home, trying to assist all of our travelers, just to unravel the complexity of the travel landscape that's ever changing. So they've been busy continually. But we have a really thriving culture of bringing our people mm. together. That's so important to FCM and to Flight Center. So we tried not to ever fully stop that. You know, even though things were done on a much more local basis, we tried to have some limited engagements when we could, Great. where we could, as restrictions lifted and, and waned. Mm -hmm. So that's always been just critically important. But now that we're truly back, and we're able to have conferences and we're able to do in-person training. I mean, it's just been a complete game changer because our people, like you said, felt maybe like, are we ever going to be able to do this again? And so right. those firsts have been so important. But right. that thriving in-person culture, that ability to always find a way for our customers and that approach that we have is really something that's critical to FCM and to our culture. So could not be happier than to see our people back. Um, getting in front of a, a room you know, full of team leaders or salespeople or account executives and seeing them be able to just um, have that collaboration again is so important, yes. it really makes me happy. So, so one of one of the the things that we've seen trends around is is the whole concept of digital nomads, mm. and the idea that, of course, during the worst of things, people moved out of cities, could work anywhere, so they moved someplace they wanted to live <laughs> and didn't have the commute anyway. Some of those digital nomads haven't come back to the commute, so. It's one of the things that we're tracking. How does it affect policy? How, where do companies see a business trip might have been a commute this longer, like two, now they live two hours from a city and now it's actually a commute right. that they might be getting uh, someone to the office twice a month. Mm. Are you seeing that your customers are dealing with the digital nomad activity in one way or the other? Are there trends that you see on your side? Yeah, we really are. I mean, I think that most companies have experienced some level of that, and it certainly changes the future of travel. Like we talked about, mm. the reason that people are getting together internally has a lot to mm. do with you know getting that collaboration back. Uh, but also we're seeing policy changes, you know, for sure, because there is gonna be an increased cost to the companies to bring those people together that are no longer living within commutable distance. Mm -hmm. But I think that's okay. And I think for the most part, most of our customers and industry colleagues that we're talking about are seeing that that is one of the changes that's bringing about a positive mm -hmm. opportunity for people, you know, for that people first that we talked about. So I think we need to adapt with it. 
I think we need to be able to consult for our customers and be able to provide the tools and the platforms to support those individuals because mm -hmm. it is going to be the way of the future. And it's a positive thing, you know, for individuals and for families and for the work-life balance. Yeah, I think we're never going back completely. Right. Right. Um, what you what you said triggered uh, probably a third trend for sure that we see as well, which is self-service. Yeah. As, uh, as a leapfrog into what uh, had been a struggle through the, you know, the end of the 90s when it was just invented and then into the aughts mm. and always, you know, what's your online adoption and other things that, you know, chatbots and things that are certainly AI that has come into uh, more recently, the whole ecosystem continuum. Um, and I think the pandemic in a way made touchless so cool that now touchless and self-service almost ha come together in the same package. That's right. How do you see that with your with your clients, with your own services that you're providing? Yeah, I mean, we certainly see from all of our customers that need to have that one-stop shop online mm -hmm. so that you know we're able to recreate the experience that you would get with a travel consultant to the, to the best of our ability yeah. with an online platform. And that's what we've done certainly with FCM. I know lots of other companies have done the same. I think we're in a moment of time, obviously, because of the complexity of traveling and the landscape and the restrictions that are still there, that every interaction is, is more with the consultant and more questions and so forth. But that's right. eventually going to subside. Um, and so to the extent that we can provide the tools and the answers within the platform mm -hmm. for the short term, we're doing that. But it's really mm -hmm. more about that long term need to have mm -hmm. that omni channel approach and, and really to get all of the tools, the assistance, the, not just the booking capability, but all right. of the resources through that one platform. Right. We used to call it in one of my former jobs, the not happy path. <laughs> so it, it, there are so many exceptions to yeah. the rule now that there is almost there is no happy path to doing that easily online. Do you see that uh, within a policy construct that uh, there will be some lessons learned by travelers that they are more likely to stay in policy as the next big wave of travel comes? I don't know about that in particular, <laughs> Suzanne. That would be uh, probably wonderful for all of the CFOs to hear right. out there. I think that there's certainly a drive towards having everything uh, within your reservation system. So in other words, from a risk management perspective, right. knowing where your travelers are. We've been talking about this for years, right? But now it's really, really critically important because I think customers understand that when you need help, we need to be able to access all of that information in one system. So I certainly see a drive mm -hmm. towards attachment, adoption, and really making sure that everything is covered in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Not 100% sure about policy compliance. Right. I think that's probably going to vary from one The company. wish list still. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, my opinion. Um, do, do clients ask you uh, as you go into RFPs or your, you know, I'm sure that sales didn't slow down during the pandemic. How is technology viewed in the buyer seat as they approach TMC services today, where yeah, does that fit? Technology has never been more important. I mean, I think that, you know, back in the day when we used to present and pitch our company and, and our services, technology always took like the back seat. It was the end of the presentation, would run the out demo. of time. Absolutely, <laughs> would run out of time, you know, in most cases before we got to the demo and would have to rush through it. Now technology is 75% of what we talk about. You know, it's all about the platform and to your point, not just about the online booking tool, it's about all the other systems mm -hmm. that we can connect to, the API um, offering and, and you know expense management, risk management, uh, pre-approval tools, mm -hmm. traveler services. It's all about technology. And so I think that as a business, finding that perfect blend, you know, what we like to call at FCM is the, the alternative approach that, that we always find a way within our culture that could that really consumes technology mm -hmm. as well as that personal relationship and that experience in the people area then we've talked about people a lot how do how does that change who you hire what 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 is your what is your long term well short term really yeah. how how does that change the way that that your your the makeup of your people yeah. is made it really has changed things quite a bit i mean we're a travel company first and foremost but we're more technology led than ever before and so we're hiring many more computer programmers developers engineers it changes mm -hmm. the way we recruit it changes the way we manage our talent mm -hmm. it changes our compensation structure in many cases and the benefits that we offer because is that part of our business is different than our traditional right. frontline travel consultant sales team 
and account managers. And, and those, I mean, certainly the frontline travel consultants are always going to be paramount to our business. And customer right. service is key. But the technology side is, is absolutely changing, you know, the face of, of our teams in many ways, which is great. Yeah, I mean, I see that analogous in our association as well. I think yeah. the way that we're opening up topics that are important, I think it's important for us, uh, much like we did in November, to make sure that we've got topics that might not just be relevant for a policymaker where they mm -hmm. sit or the salesperson, because that typically was was where our two core persona members were was the buyer making policy or doing procurement and the other one was the supplier usually sales yeah. who who came to our events and i think what we see now is that they're at a seat at the table with it could be the cio right. who worries about um risk of laptops crossing borders yes or you might be a seat, a seat have a seat at the table the next day with hr and the other pieces that have to do with recruitment or mobility for bringing people on relocation assignments mm -hmm. and that has sometimes been a different group. We also see that mar that marketing types of things, the events used to fall under marketing and now many of those decisions are going under the travel procurement bucket as well. So I think as we see that expansion of uh, how travel now touches, it's really a nucleus of all kinds of things within a corporate environment. Yeah. I see that you you certainly have that, that nucleus as well. While travel is your nucleus, you have all of these, um, these worker types that need to make that Met that happen for your customers. Couldn't agree more. Data privacy is probably the only thing I'd add to the list, <laughs> right? And all of the data security yes. questionnaires that are so key with any right. RFP nowadays, it's it's a, a really big consideration and something that we may have to make sure we've got covered on behalf of our customer base. So I think as we, we come close to the end, I have one last question. I'd love to know what your crystal ball is, Charlene, about what it says about international travel based on everything you hear from customers and suppliers what will it take for international travel to feel like it's on its way back? You know, everything that we're seeing from our customers and in all conversations with suppliers and industry experts is that as soon as barriers are lifted, people will travel. And that is absolutely true for international travel. Um, the restrictions that still exist, you know, the testing upon re-entry, mm -hmm. and, and in some cases you still right. have to travel uh, or test in order to travel to destination. I think that we need those removed in order to fully experience the international travel and to get those numbers back up. But I have no doubt that it's going to happen. Um, certainly our domestic travel in some cases is almost back at pre-COVID oh. levels. I mean, it's really grown so considerably, but I think international will do the same. And again, opening up the world for those who wanna see, that's, that's our company purpose. And I think that international travel is so key to that. So, yeah. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Absolutely. Hoping that happens soon. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for being with us today, Thank Suzanne. You, it's been a pleasure. So thanks so much for joining us today at FCM Think. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation and all of the conversations to come.